Hi, I'm Jared Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory at UAB, and this is continuing our series of short videos where we're talking about the new projects in the lab and the new findings that are coming out of the laboratory. Today I want to talk about hot brains and how a hot brain may be leading to your pain, fatigue, depression, cognitive symptoms, and other problems. And I want to tell you how we're investigating that in the lab in this uh, really neat new tool that we have to work with. So the basic idea is pretty simple. We're all comfortable with the idea of measuring temperature as a way of knowing when our body's immune system is being activated. So if a reasonably healthy person wakes up in the morning and they feel really horrible, like they've been hit by a truck and they don't know why, one of the first things they're gonna guess is, well, maybe I'm sick. Now, you could go to the doctor and they could run tests to know if your immune system has been activated because you're sick, but that's not what pe people typically do. What they'll do is they'll take a thermometer and they'll stick it under their tongue or they'll stick it under their arm. There's a number of ways you can use it, but it gives you body temperature, core temperature. And most people know if you look at that number and it says 100.4 Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius, they'll think, okay, I have a fever, that's probably why I feel bad. You also know if you see a number like 104 Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you'll say, okay, this is pretty serious, I may need to go to hospital, I'm really sick. So we're comfortable with this idea because we know that temperature is a very reliable part of our immune system's reaction to something. So as you know, we take that concept and we apply it to the brain. We think there's a lot of conditions where there's inflammation, where there's an immune system activation, but it's occurring in the brain only. In that case, you wouldn't see a temperature increase in the body. You would have to measure it directly in the brain. The problem is there's no place you can stick this temperature probe to get brain temperature because the brain is protected. So we have to find a non-invasive, non-direct way of looking at brain temperature. And we can actually do that with magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. Now this is the same MRI that you would use in the hospital if you needed to get a picture of your knee or even your brain, but we're using it in a different way. And this is called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And that means instead of looking at the structures inside your body, we're actually looking at chemistry. And I don't want to go into the specifics, but we can use the results of that scan to get temperature throughout the entire brain. And it basically relies on how water reacts to temperature, and we can detect those changes in the scan. This technique is being used by a few other groups, in particular a group at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and they've been using this for a few years to look at problems such as stroke. You can see in this image on the screen now, on the right side where that red box is, that white region of the brain is where a stroke has occurred, and you can see the numbers from the MRS scan on top of it. Now it's not unfortunately in temperature, but higher numbers mean higher temperature in this particular scan, and you can see that the numbers are highest on top of the region where there's the stroke, and that probably means there's a neuroinflammatory response where that stroke is as the immune system tries to repair the damage by that stroke. Now we're taking this, but we're actually trying to apply it throughout the entire brain. So we're not looking for a problem in a particular region. We want to know what's happening across the brain from top to bottom. And that allows us to do a couple of things. One, we can average all the values we get throughout the brain because there'll be thousands of temperature measurements throughout the brain when we do this scan. And that'll give us a really good estimate of your overall brain temperature. But also, since we have all these measurements, we can create a 3D temperature map or heat map that we can navigate through in order to find regions of the brain that may be hotter than they're supposed to, and that may show us where there's a problem. I want to show you some of the preliminary data that we've collected so far. There's not much. We're going to be running a lot more people over the next few weeks and months. You can see on the left side, this is the output that we look at to determine temperature. You don't have to worry about that part. In the middle is a brain we're looking from the top down, and you can see a color-coded slice of the temperature measurement. So the values aren't there, but you can see that green is normal, yellow is slightly elevated temperature, and red is fever territory temperature. And you can see that in this particular individual, their temperature gets hotter as it gets to the outside parts of the brain, particularly on the left side. But the most important part is on the right, and this is where we see 
temperature, whole brain temperature results for five people. The first two are healthy controls. The next two have chronic fatigue syndrome. And the last person has rheumatoid arthritis plus chronic fatigue syndrome. And the temperatures are in Celsius, which you see on the left side. So what's interesting here is the two healthy controls that we ran, they both have brain temperatures that are a little bit less than 99.5 Fahrenheit. So it's hotter than body temperature, but that's to be expected, but still not you know, in the range of fever. The two people with chronic fatigue syndrome have brain temperatures that are over 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is pretty hot. That's something that we might consider to be a fever. And the person with rheumatoid arthritis and chronic fatigue syndrome has a brain temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is also quite hot. Now, that's may not seem like a huge difference between 99.5 and 101, but that actually is a pretty big change in the brain. The brain is supposed to be in a very narrow band of temperature, and it doesn't like to be running too hot. So this is something that may be important for these individuals and may be driving some of their symptoms. So next, we have to recruit a lot of individuals to undergo the scan. We have to see how it's working and how people with chronic pain and fatigue differ from healthy controls. So we're going to be recruiting people with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, and rheumatoid arthritis, and maybe major depressive disorder as well. The rheumatoid arthritis, we actually got a grant just two days ago from the Rheumatology Research Foundation to study this in RA. And the idea is there are a lot of people with RA who receive really good drugs to reduce their joint inflammation, but a lot of them are still profoundly fatigued. And we think that's because the drugs aren't reaching the brain to reduce the inflammation in the brain. So we're going to test that with this scan. I'm also really excited about what it may show us in fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome because, as most people know, we desperately need some kind of objective test for those disorders, and elevated brain temperature is one possibility. So if you're interested in being in one of those studies and you're in the Alabama area, you can look on our Facebook page. I'll put a link in the description below. We generally announce there as soon as we open up a new study that we try to get the word out through as many venues as possible. For everyone else, just stay tuned to this channel. As we get new results, we will talk about those as soon as we can and get that information out to you. So just to Keep an eye on the channel. There's still a lot that we have to talk about, so I'll try to put out these videos as fast as I can. All right, we'll talk to you soon.